Craigslist has never been my favorite site to use, but after being fired from my job, I was struggling to find work, so I thought I would give Craigslist another try. I was willing to do anything at this point, but I found one ad that was offering multiple jobs on a newly purchased house. The job description read something like, All-round handyman wanted for decorating, gardening, and other miscellaneous tasks. I'm a joiner by trade, so I'm pretty good with my hands. I contacted the advertiser, who I'll call Reese, and once I told him of my experience, he told me he would pay me $100 a day cash, and it would be a minimum of two weeks' work, but I could be working up to 12-hour days, depending on the task for that day. I agreed, and after meeting Reese, he told me he would give me a one-day trial, to see if I would be a good fit. I turned up on Monday and met Reese at the house. He walked me around the house and then said he was going to start me out in the garden. He gave me a list of what needed to be done and said if I finished it all that same day, he would hire me for the rest of the work. I worked my ass off that day and at about 9 p.m. after the sun had gone down, I had completed everything on the list. Reese came out to check my work and said he never thought I would actually get it done and that he just wanted to see how hard I could work. He offered me the job, and gave me an envelope with $100 in it. See you in the morning, 8 a.m., he said as he walked back into the house. The next morning, I arrived bright and early, and Reese gave me a list of things that needed doing that day. About 12 p.m., Reese came and asked if I wanted any lunch. Hey, I'm going out for a bite to eat. You want me to bring you something back? It's on me. I said I was okay, as I had brought some food with me. Once Reese had left, I started to relax a little. Although he left me to get on with it, I felt like he was constantly watching me. About 10 minutes after Reese had left, I heard a thud upstairs. As far as I was aware, there was no one else in the house. I thought nothing more of it and carried on with whatever job I was doing at the time. Then I heard it again. This time it was more distinct and it definitely sounded like someone was up there. I decided to go and check it out. I went upstairs cautiously. It wasn't really my business, but I was thinking that maybe someone climbed in through a window. But after looking around, I couldn't find anyone, or even find anything that would explain the sound I heard. As I made my way back downstairs, I heard it again. It sounded like it came from the master bedroom. I went in cautiously and looked around, checking under the bed when I noticed a sheet hanging up in the corner of the room. I pulled it back to reveal a closet door. My heart sank, and I trembled, thinking that maybe something, or more likely someone, was in here. I took a deep breath and opened the closet door, and I'm glad to report that there was no one in there. I did, however, notice a small wooden box on the floor, which seemed out of place, seeing as though there was nothing else in there. I know it wasn't really my place to snoop, but I was curious as to why there would be a single box in the closet which was hidden by a sheet. I opened the box and found a pile of photographs, maybe about two dozen in total. I don't want to say what these photographs were, but I will tell you that no one should ever be in possession of these types of photographs. No one that doesn't have a sick mind anyway. I heard the front door to the house close and Reese shouted my name. I put the box back and tried to make it look as though I hadn't touched the sheet. I came out of the bedroom as Reese was coming up the stairs. He stared at me. Everything okay? Why are you in my bedroom? I explained that I had heard something and thought it might be someone trying to break in through a back window, but couldn't find anything. As I walked past Reese, he moved to the side to block my way and looked right into my eyes as though he didn't trust me or to look into my soul to see if I knew something. I kind of stuttered nervously. <laughs> I, I best get back to work. Reese moved out of my way, and I took a deep breath as I walked down the stairs. I knew Reese was full on watching me as I walked away, and I certainly didn't feel safe being there anymore. I tried to think of a way that I could leave and just not come back without giving it away that I knew what secrets were hiding in that closet. I wasn't smart enough to come up with anything that didn't sound like a blatant lie. Eventually, I finished my work for the day, and when I said goodbye to Reese, he handed me an envelope with $200 in it and said, You did a good job today. There's a little something extra in there for you for all your hard work, but let's keep that between us. 
I thanked him and made my way home. Once I got home, I was unsure what to do. I wanted to call the police, but I was scared I might get into trouble for looking around his house without permission. Anyways, I decided to call the police and let them know what I found. I felt it was more important to deal with the content of those photos, even if it did mean I landed in trouble as well. The police said they would look into it. I decided I didn't want to work for Reese, and I didn't want his hush money, so I returned the extra hundred dollars and put it in his mailbox. I sent a message to Reese the next day, saying that I was no longer able to work for him. I don't know if anything ever came from my statement to the police, but I hope I never see that guy again. I was babysitting my neighbor's son, Grady, a few nights ago. He was a little terror, but his mom paid pretty well. I watched him a few times before, and I knew that the best way to control him was to keep him eating. Otherwise, he'd just run around the house and break things. That night, he was particularly wild, so I said that I'd order whatever pizza he wanted if he promised to calm down. That seemed to work. I called the restaurant and ordered a pepperoni pizza with pineapples and extra garlic. It sounded disgusting, but that was what Grady wanted. The man who took my order seemed pretty normal at first, but when I told him what toppings I wanted, he gasped and wouldn't say anything for a long time. Then his voice got all shaky, and he asked if there was anything else I needed. I finished the order and hung up. The guy had given me the creeps, but I quickly forgot about it and went back to watching Grady. We waited about 20 minutes until the delivery guy arrived. I opened the door and saw a middle-aged man holding the pizza. He looked too old to be a delivery guy, but he was wearing the uniform. When he said hello, I recognized his voice from the phone. I reached for the pizza, but he pulled it away. He asked if I was home alone tonight. I told him that the house was filled with people. I grabbed the pizza and basically threw the money at him. Then I closed the door. As we were eating, Grady asked me why I was so upset. I guess I had a panicked look on my face. I told him that there wasn't anything to worry about, but then I heard the floorboards creak from the other room. It sounded like the delivery man had snuck inside the house. I grabbed Grady's hand and led him into the downstairs bathroom. Then I told him to lock the door behind me and wait there until I said he could come out. He didn't seem nervous. In fact, all he cared about was getting more pizza. I left him in the bathroom hoping that the lock on the door would keep him safe, and then I went to grab my phone. I walked through the hallway and living room, looking around for signs of anyone. The whole house was completely quiet. When I got to the sofa, my phone was no longer there. I knew that there was a landline in Grady's mom's office, so that was my only option. I walked as quietly as I could. I pushed open the office door, careful not to make a sound, and saw the house phone sitting on a desk. I ran to it, but someone jumped at me from the side. The intruder had been hiding in the office, waiting for me to enter. I was shoved onto the floor, my head slamming against the side of a desk. I felt a foot press against my neck. The pizza delivery man was standing over me. Where is he? The man screamed. I tried to answer, but no sound came out. I couldn't breathe. He raised his foot off my neck. Let us go, I said. Please. He kicked me in the side. Where's Grady? I want my son back! Are you Grady's father? He kicked me again. Yes! Where is he? Grady's mom was divorced. All I knew about her ex-husband was that he was in jail for some violent crime, and she and her son had cut all contact and moved to a new town. I guess he had gotten released, and ended up working some minimum wage delivery job in the same town. When he recognized his son's very specific pizza order, he was finally able to track them down. I didn't know much about this man, but I knew that I needed to keep him away from Grady. I lied and told him that Grady was asleep upstairs in his room. He kicked me once more and left. I waited on the floor until I could hear the man walking up the stairs. Then I jumped up and ran to the bathroom where I'd left Grady. The door was open and he wasn't there. I was terrified that his father had already taken him. I looked through the hallway and the living room. Then I found Grady in the kitchen. He had snuck there to get more pizza. I wanted to scream at him for leaving the bathroom, but we didn't have time. I grabbed him and ran out the door. By then, his father had heard us. He was running down the stairs, screaming. 
I slammed the front door, led Grady to my car, and then drove straight to the police station. As we left, the man stood in front of the house and screamed that he wouldn't stop until he found us. Grady's mom met us at the police station. By then, we told the police everything that happened. They'd already sent officers to the house, but the man was gone. Grady didn't seem too scared. He just complained about not being able to finish his pizza. His mom, though, she got a really sad look on her face. He found us, was all she said. They moved away after that. The police never caught the father. And as for me, that was the very last time I agreed to babysit anyone. Let me tell you the story of how I developed social anxiety disorder. I used to work night shifts, so I sleep during the daytime and a few years ago I woke up to some pretty terrible news. I had a bunch of missed calls and unread text messages from my landlord. They were telling me to call them as soon as possible. I called my landlord and he tells me that there's a leak in the apartment downstairs, one that they figured was coming from my apartment. As a result, they'd shut off the water to my apartment while I was asleep. That meant no shower, no coffee. I couldn't even flush my own toilet. The only consolation was that I'd found a plumber to find and fix the leak, and he'd reimburse me the money if I kept a receipt or invoice. Now, it's already around 3 in the afternoon when I learned the news about the water being shut off, which was obviously coming up to the end of most people's working days. I knew of a few emergency plumbers who might be able to deal with the problem at short notice, but all of them seemed to be too busy to take the job. I ended up calling around to a few friends to see if I could stay at their place until the problem was dealt with, and luckily, one of my girlfriends was more than willing to take me in. But she also threw me a kind of Hail Mary suggestion as to where I could find someone who wasn't a pro, but knew enough about plumbing to be able to come over and help. Craigslist. I didn't think it'd be much help. I mean, I figured most people would just use it to sell stuff and organize CD hookups or whatever. But then again... I hadn't actually visited the site all that much, and to my surprise there was a section of the services part of the site that was called Household. Then what do you know? The third post down said something like, 37 year old handyman looking for work, with the post saying how he knew a little about everything and would take jobs at short notice at really low prices. It seemed way too good to be true, and I suppose that's because it was. I give the guy a call on the number he'd included in his post and explain the situation to him. Honestly, I expected that he'd give me the sorry, too busy line that all the others had. You'd think they'd at least arrange a time to take the job. But no, he seemed only too happy to drive out to me that evening to see if he could shut off the leaky pipe then go turn my water back on. I was literally like... All my prayers had been answered. I mean, the guy even said it himself that it sounded like a relatively simple job, and he was amazed another plumber hadn't come out already to just open up the floorboards, close off the pipe, then turn the water back on. I knew absolutely nothing about it, so when he said opening up the floorboards or whatever, and how that was a simple process, I just totally ate it up. About an hour or so after I'd made the first phone call, the guy shows up to my apartment and tells me he's outside. I realize that I totally forgot to tell him which apartment I was in, so I let him know and I buzz him in. The guy then shows up at my door looking totally legit and I show him into the bathroom, which was where the landlord thought the leak was coming from. I then went back to my TV room and carried on preparing my very late breakfast. Remember, I worked night shifts at the time. A few minutes later, the guy, who called himself Tony calls me into the bathroom and says something like, Does this look right to you? I then walk towards the bathroom, stick my head around the door to take a peek, and that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I know, there's a bright light in front of me, and I groggily realize that it's coming from the little pen flashlight of an EMT checking if I'm responsive or not. I start panicking, asking what's going on, and they tell me to keep still while they get a stretcher up to my apartment. They put me on it, wheel me out into the hallway outside, and there's the friend who had agreed to let me stay at her place. She's in tears, asking the EMT if I'm going to be okay, and I remember just relaxing and sinking into the stretcher when I heard them say, yes. I just felt like I wanted to sleep for days, 
But when I told the EMTs that I was feeling tired and could I just nap while they were driving me to the hospital, they kept telling me to stay awake, to do anything I could to stay awake. In the end, they kept asking me these dumb, small talk style questions to just keep me talking. Then at the hospital, I'm pretty sure they gave me something to keep me from drifting off because apparently falling asleep with a head injury can actually be fatal. And not long after, the cops showed up to take a statement about the plumber guy from me. They'd gone through my place and found a bunch of valuables missing, obvious stuff too like the TV being gone from the mount on the wall, all my jewelry gone with my bedroom completely ransacked. Only then did I actually put two and two together and realize what had happened. That wasn't a plumber at all. He hadn't even touched anything in my bathroom. He just used the whole handyman thing as a front to rob people. One of the cops told me that I was the fourth person to get robbed by the same handyman guy that month, only because he uses different phone numbers and never told anyone much about himself. They hadn't been able to track him down. As far as I know, they never caught the guy. He just pulled a few robberies, then quit when the public got a warning about hiring anonymous handymen on the internet. Maybe he's still out there, robbing people, doing his thing, switching it up and not getting caught. And I hope those other people he'd robbed and beat got over what happened to him. But I didn't. Like I said, I developed a serious anxiety disorder after the attack, and it hit me in a way I just didn't expect. Bad things happen to good people sometimes, I know that. And I took a lot of comfort in knowing that the cops were at least closing the net around the guy. But then after I got out of the hospital, it must have been like two or three days before I realized I hadn't even left the house. I got nervous getting food from the delivery guys that dropped it off at my apartment building, but I figured that feeling would just go away after a while. Only, it didn't. I got this tight feeling in my chest, this itchy feeling all over me, whenever anyone I didn't know walked outside my apartment or outside in the hallway. I still sometimes find myself running to the people with the gun I bought, staring through the little glass circle and just waiting to see the face of the guy who robbed me on the other side. I know I'm never going to see it either, but I still find myself doing it. I got a nasty little scar on my jawline from where the guy hit me, and even the EMTs said I must have had a steel skeleton or something because it's a miracle my jaw wasn't broken. But I guess I got a lot of scars that people can't see, along with a wound that I'm not sure will ever properly heal. When I was eight years old, my family moved into the house I grew up in. It wasn't an old house, and no one had died in it, and it didn't even feel creepy. It was just an average suburban house in your average southern suburbs. The way the house was set up, when you came in the front door, there was a hallway with two bedrooms and a bathroom to the right. The large living room was in front of you, with half a wall separating it from the dining room to the left, and the kitchen was on the other side of the dining room. Where the kitchen and living room met, there was another small hallway, the master bedroom, a bedroom that was used as an office, a bathroom, and then the breakfast nook leading to a laundry and utility area at the end of the kitchen. My room was to the right of the front door and down the hallway past the bathroom, with the other bedroom on this hallway used for storage, mostly as I was my mother's only child, and my half-brother and sister didn't live with us and rarely came to visit. The first time anything really happened in the house, I was about nine, and I'd lost my last tooth. Still being a kid, of course, the tooth fairy was expected, so when I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a figure standing in the middle of my room, I assumed it was the Tooth Fairy. It was bald and only about three or four feet tall, about the size of an average child, standing completely still in the middle of my room. I remember my parents telling me that if I was awake, the Tooth Fairy wouldn't leave me any money, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. When I got up the next morning, I excitedly told my parents that I'd seen the Tooth Fairy the night before. I described what I'd seen, but they told me it was just a dream. For the next several years after that, I continued seeing and hearing minor things around the house. When I was home alone, cabinet doors would open and close. I'd hear dishes being moved around in the kitchen or catch movement out of the corner of my eye. The most common occurrence was often at night I'd wake up and see a young woman hovering over my bed. She was dressed like the Rosie the Riveter character from the old posters from the 1940s, with the red and white bandana around her hair and a denim shirt. When I would see her, she'd stare at me for a few minutes and then slowly float over my body and out through the wall behind me. I was never afraid of her, though. 
When I was about 12, my parents divorced, and it was just me and my mother living in the house. By the time I was in my late teens, my mother was rarely home, and my house became the hangout for me and my friends. Most nights, everyone gathering together to play Dungeons and Dragons or something similar after work. One night we were hanging out, but didn't want to play, so I pulled out a Ouija board I'd picked up at the local toy store a few weeks before, wanting to try it out. We sat in my room to play with the lights out and the door closed, and it went pretty normally, nothing crazy happening for the most part. The only strange thing that happened was at one point we asked something to show itself, and at that point we heard the front door open and close, and heavy footsteps come down the hall towards my room. The handle of my door started to turn, and one of the guys jumped up and locked the door before it could open. We didn't hear anything else, no footsteps moving away from the door or anything. And after a little while, we turned on the light and opened the door to see if my mother had come home unexpectedly. The house was empty, and the front door locked. We decided we'd had enough of that game at that point, and everyone went home. A few weeks later, we were hanging out at my house again, this time playing Dungeons & Dragons. Though one of the girls that usually came had to work late and had classes in the morning, so she said she wouldn't be coming. While we were sitting in the living room to play, at around 2 in the morning, suddenly we heard footsteps run across my wooden front porch. It sounded like someone very short or a small child running quickly. Everyone in the room heard it, and we had a conversation as to if our friend had changed her mind and had just arrived as she was very short, and it made more sense than a child running through the neighborhood at that time of night. When she never came into the house, we all got up to look, and there was no one outside, and her car wasn't in the yard. Her boyfriend, who was with us, gave her a call and verified that it wasn't her and she'd just arrived home on the other side of town and was headed to bed. Around this time, the activity in the house picked up. I saw shadow figures with red eyes often in the living and dining room of the house and heard footsteps and other noises at all hours of the day or night. I started waking up in my room to see hooded figures standing near my window and door. It was around this time my half-brother, who I was close to, passed away. It was sudden, and I hadn't seen him in years as he'd gotten into drugs, and my mother had decided to keep me away from him because she didn't want him to be a bad influence on me. After that, I'd wake up hearing his voice saying my name in the middle of the night often. On a whim one night, I sat down and typed out a letter to him on my computer that was in my bedroom since I was home alone that night and was bored. Now, this computer was hooked up to an old dot matrix printer, one of the really loud kinds that makes all kinds of racket when it's running. After I wrote the letter, I felt silly for it and deleted it without saving or printing it and shut down the computer before I went to bed. Around three in the morning, I woke up and my bed was soaking wet. At first, I thought my puppy had peed on the bed because he was too small to get down, even though he was housebroken and I'd taken him out just before bed. I got up to let him outside and change my bed sheets when I realized the wet was just water and it was more than a tiny puppy could have made. On my way to take my blankets to the laundry room, I passed the bathroom in my hallway and noticed the light was on, even though I'd turned off all the lights before bed. There, sitting on the counter, was a pitcher from the kitchen, with the inside still wet. When I was really young, my brother used to wake my sister and I up by throwing water on us because it made me laugh. When I got back into my room and started making my bed, I noticed a piece of paper laying on top of my printer. It was the letter that I'd written to him, never saved or printed. The computer was still shut down and the printer was off, but it had been printed out, torn off the printer, and laid on top as if someone had read it. Normal things like this continued for a few years when I lived there on and off, before things turned dark shortly before I moved out of the house for good. The hooded figures began to appear more often. I woke up one night with the feeling that I was being stared at, only to roll over and see what looked like a rotting corpse a few inches from my face. Another night, I woke up to a hooded man standing at the foot of my bed, with my bedroom door open when it had been closed before. He held up his hand and a ball of blue light appeared in his palm, which he threw at my face. He and the ball disappeared just before it hit me, but the room was so cold that I could see my breath on a normally hot southern summer night. When I was in my early 20s, after I moved out for good, I had one last experience in the house. My mother hadn't been to the house in months and was preparing to sell it. I had told one of my cousins about the things that had happened there through the years. One night he decided that he was bored, and he and a friend of his would pick me up to go ghost hunting in the house while it was empty. Each of us had a camera and a voice recorder. We set a recorder in my old bedroom and spent an hour or two wandering around the house taking pictures. When we got done, we came back to my room and sat to listen to the recording and discuss all of the nothing that we had found. 
On the recording, we could hear our voices moving from room to room and talking about how my cousin's friend's camera had a sexy shutter sound and the fact that my camera stopped working almost as soon as we walked in the door. About 20 minutes into the recording, when we could hear all three of our voices echoing from the other side of the house, a deep voice that sounded like it was right up against the microphone said, Get the fuck out! We immediately obliged. I found out a few years later that my mom actually had several experiences in that house. She would wake up to find an older man in his 50s or 60s looking through her closet or seeing him just wandering around the house. When she'd say anything or get his attention, he'd turn around and look at her and then vanish. She always thought she was just dreaming or something, but with everything I saw over the years at that house, I can't help but to think it was something else. Shortly after I turned 18, my parents kicked me out of the house. It wasn't surprising, since we've never had a good relationship, but the stress from not having a home anymore was scary, especially because I was a woman facing being homeless on the streets. I ended up crashing on my best friend's sofa until she left for college, and I had enough to get a crappy apartment. And crappy is too nice of a word for the place I was renting, but at the time, it was the only place I could afford. And since I worked two jobs to afford it, it wasn't like I was home often anyway. Anyway, like I said, I worked two jobs full time to support myself, but I never had anything left over after my bills were paid. So when my best friend sent me a food delivery gift card for my 19th birthday, I was ecstatic. I was used to ramen or box mac and cheese, so to be able to have takeout after over a year was more than I could ask for. My best friend was struggling at the time too, being a college kid and all, so the gift card was only $25, but for that, I was still able to order a basic combo meal at a burger shop. I saved it for my birthday dinner, and remember feeling so embarrassed that I couldn't afford to tip high. The gift card barely covered the food and the delivery charges, but I did manage to get together $2 that I found around the house, and felt proud that I could tip at all. The doorbell rang not long after I found the dollars and when I answered the door, there was an older man who was frowning hard. He didn't say anything to me, but held out my bag of food. I reached out to grab the food from him, but he quickly pulled it out of my reach and asked angrily why there wasn't a tip added to the order. I felt so embarrassed at his words and shyly held out the crumpled two dollars, which he took, but not before laughing. He practically shoved the bag of food in my hands before he went off about how poor I have to be that I can't afford to leave a decent tip, how people without money shouldn't order out, how bad of a person I was for not giving him a proper tip for all the hard work he did. It went on and on, and after a couple of minutes of hearing the man yell, in which he kept stepping closer and closer to me, I gathered the courage to say a quick, I'm sorry, and closed the door on him. Right when I turned my lock, the knob of the door started turning. He was trying to get into my apartment. I backed up away from the door as he knocked at first, but his careful knocking started to turn into banging on my door as he tried to turn the handle. All the while, the man screamed he wanted me to add a tip to the online order. Otherwise, he wasn't leaving. I was 19, alone, and didn't have anyone to call other than my best friend, who was at college out of state. I knew if I called my dad, he would just hang up and I was too scared to call the police and bother them when it was over something as stupid as a tip. I already felt bad that I couldn't give the man more than two dollars, so even scared, I felt like it was my fault. Eventually, my neighbors across from me opened the door and told the delivery man that she called the police and they were on their way. The man banged on my door a final time and called me a name I would rather not repeat, then left. I was shaking and crying uncontrollably that I didn't hear a word my neighbor was saying behind my door until I heard sirens. After talking me down, my neighbor convinced me to let the police, who she had in fact called, into my apartment and held my hand in encouragement as I told the police what happened. They took my report and helped me call the food delivery app to explain the situation, and they assured me that man would be banned from using the app in the future. But all I could think about was that Because of me, this man, who now knew where I lived, couldn't work. He was going to lose his job because of me, and he knew where I lived. I ended up breaking my lease and staying in the local shelter for a couple of months until I could afford a deposit on another place. 
I don't order food through apps anymore. I know now, years later, that I wasn't at fault. But still, you never know who you're inviting to your house when you order food. They can be a nice person, like my neighbor who helped me. Or they can be a raving maniac that now has your address if anything bad were to happen. This story happened right as I was starting to get out on my own. I had just graduated college and accepted a new job in a new city. To take away the stress of bills, I decided to get a roommate. After months of nothing, I turned to Craigslist. I wasn't super thrilled at the idea, but I severely underestimated my expenses, and I was beginning to panic. Finally, I arranged to meet with a girl who was around my age. After talking for a day or two, we learned that we had a ton in common, even moving to a new place and new jobs. During the meeting, she was very shy. She was friendly, but definitely not an extrovert by any means. We talked for a good while, and nothing stuck out to me as a red flag. She seemed like she was just a typical woman who was trying to make it. I offered her the room, and she agreed, moving in that weekend. At first, things were fine. She was helpful, kept her space tidy, and bills were taken care of on time. It wasn't until two months in that things took a turn for the worse. It was a subtle shift. She started to lose touch of personal boundaries. I would be with my boyfriend in my room with the door shut, and she would barge in without even announcing. If friends were over, she would stay under our feet the entire time. If we wanted to go out, she would ask to join. Then, it progressed to her being irrationally upset if I came home late from work or a night out. Getting annoyed, I talked to her and filed it in the back of my mind thinking it would be fine. It wasn't. My things kept going missing. Not just normal things either. My underwear, bras, and toothbrushes would just vanish. Then, the last two incidents were enough to send me over the edge. The first incident happened when I came home from work early. Inside the house, things were silent. I knew she was here because of her car, and I thought she was just sleeping. What I didn't know, but soon found out, was she was asleep, just in my bed instead of hers. I woke her up as soon as I registered it, and she apologized that it wouldn't happen again. I was beginning to get a bad vibe from her that just kept getting darker. Then, that same night, I went to bed like usual. I briefly woke up in the middle of the night because of a noise and realized she was watching me. I yelled at her to get out and locked my door, putting an accent chair under the knob for good measure. Still creeped out, I barely slept the rest of the time. I could hear her rifling around in her room until it went quiet around three in the morning. Since I had been up all night, I waited until she went to work the next day and decided I was going to find out what exactly was going on with my roommate. Now, I'm not normally the type to snoop, but I felt this urge to go into her room and have a look. Her room was neat, everything in its place. I took time looking at pictures, and it was odd that she didn't have any with her in them, not even family pictures. None of the pictures were of anybody at all. It was all pictures of landscaping, random spots of grass and trees. It reminded me of mediocre photography. I made my way to her closet next, assuming if I had important things that they would be in there. The first glance revealed it was messy, unlike her room. Then, there in a pile that was hidden under towels, stood a mountain of my clothes. I dug through, realizing that the only article of clothing that was missing from this pile was my undergarments. Beyond freaked out, I ravaged the rest of her room until I accidentally bumped into her nightstand and an envelope that had tape on it hit the floor. My hands were shaking as I opened the flap and dropped the photos onto the floor. The photos were of me. In some, I was showering. In others, I was sleeping. Even pictures of me leaving work were all there. Completely scared, I began to back out of the room until I saw something keeping her mattress barely a centimeter off the box spring. Now that I saw the pictures, I was already expecting the worst, afraid it was my undergarments or more pictures. 
My finding under the mattress was confusing, but eerie. Stuffed under the mattress were four licenses. All the ID cards had different names, but the same picture of my roommate wearing this demented grin. Something told me that these ID cards meant nothing good and that I needed to do something with them. When I got them to my room and started checking the names, I discovered that the names were of women who were missing. After I calmed down, I took the cards directly to the police station. I explained the situation, and since I had the cards, they believed me. I told them that my roommate was at work, and she would be back soon. We decided the best plan was to confront her at home, and I went back to wait for her. When she came inside, cop cars wailed and lit up the road outside. She turned and looked at me when she heard them, giving me this creepy, dead eyes smirk. I still remember what she said to me when she left. Guess that's my ride. Those were the last words she said to me. I still don't know what came of the women on the ID cards, or what she had done to expect police, but I also think I don't want to know. Please, someone help us. We, we don't know what to do. It's getting so bad, and in the 20 years I've lived here, this is by far the worst. Both my parents grew up in haunted houses, and of course my siblings and I have grown up in haunted houses as well. At first, my parents thought my brothers just had an imaginary friend in their closet named Joe. One of my brothers woke up screaming in the middle of the night, and I was a baby, so I don't remember, but my parents have told me about it. My parents ran in there, and he had blood all over his sheets and three very long cuts down his back. My brothers had bunk beds, and my other brother was on the bottom. My parents said he was so pale, and he wouldn't say a word. Things calmed down for a really long time, until I was about ten. I had one of my friends staying over, and we were staying up really late playing games and doing what little girls do. We started to hear scratching coming from the outside of my door, and I had a cat, so I thought it was her. I went to open it, but no one was there, so we just shrugged it off. Then it started again, and the doorknob started to jiggle, and it slowly opened, and there was a dark figure standing there. It looked like it was out of breath, and its shoulders were going up and down. Then it lunged at us, and we screamed, and my parents came running. Nothing or nobody was in the house. My friend never stayed over again, and stopped being my friend shortly after. Nine years later, just little things were happening, nothing too scary. My boyfriend, now husband, went off to basic training, and I still lived with my parents. I was only 19. I had my dog Zeus, and he was sleeping on my bed with me. He was a yellow lab. It was about 6.30 in the morning, and I had to be up at 8.30 for work. He woke me up by growling, and then I heard a weird voice in my ear, speaking a language I didn't understand. When I started to open my eyes, it started growling in my ear. I opened my eyes fast and my door slammed. My dog was standing over me with his hair standing up, looking like he was about to attack something. Another time, everyone had gone to work and I heard banging coming from my parents' room. I got Zeus off me, I jumped out of bed and ran to my parents' room. Cabinets were opening and closing fast and things were getting thrown everywhere around the room and it wouldn't stop. I slammed the door shut and ran out. My dog was now running around the house barking and growling, and then he started running into my parents' door. I said fuck it, grabbed my work clothes, got my dog, and ran the hell out of there. I dropped my dog off at my friend's and went to work early. When I got home, my parents' room was destroyed. My mother was crying and my dad was pissed. I told them everything. We decided not to talk about it again and went on with the rest of the day. My brother still lived with my parents as well. That night, my door kept opening and closing, and I kept hearing running in the hallway, so I thought it was him. I slipped on my slippers and stomped into his room. I was going to yell at him to knock off his stupid shit, but when I opened the door, he was snoring. I woke him up and made him promise it wasn't him. He told me to leave his door open to see if he sees anything. I'm halfway down the hallway, and my brother yelled at me to run back to my room and to not look back, but... Of course, I turned around, and as I turned around, I see a large black figure standing in his doorway, staring at me. It had large red eyes, just staring at me. I froze and started to whimper. My brother, being the protective big brother, came charging, telling the thing to leave me alone, 
and when he got to it, it disappeared. My brother ran to me and led me to my room and slept on the floor that night so he could stay with me. I didn't sleep. Now, a year later, I'm 20 and my husband is away for the army at the moment and we're waiting for plumbing to get done in our new house so I'm still staying with my parents. Last night, we had a bad rainstorm. I woke up to the growling again, but I couldn't move. Out of the corner of my eye, there was the figure with the red eyes again, just staring at me. Thunder started and it opened its mouth so wide it could fit my whole head inside. It had huge sharp teeth and a long skinny tongue. It started to scream and my ears started to ring. I wanted to cover them, but I couldn't. My dog was half growling and half whining at it. My parents came running in, covering their ears, but stopped mid-run when they saw the thing. My dad came running to me anyway and picked me up and carried me to his room with my dog following. Zeus had his back to us so he could face the thing and never took his eyes off the figure until it was out of sight. I was finally able to move and I started crying and shaking uncontrollably. My brother was still living at home as well and he had his girlfriend over that night. We heard her scream and then she started banging on the door so my dad opened it and she came in running and crying and shaking. We started to ask where Mike, my brother, was. Before she could answer, my brother came out of his room on his hands and feet with black eyes just staring at us. We all froze and none of us knew what to do. My brother then popped his neck and started running for us. My dad slammed the door shut and locked it. My brother started to run against it. My mom was screaming for him to get the hell out of her house and just kept repeating this while throwing things and stomping. And then, things went quiet. My dad opened the door and my brother was passed out on the floor with his nose bleeding. When my brother woke up, we told him everything. He didn't remember anything. He just remembered hearing screaming and then it all went black. He told us all sorry and then stayed quiet for the rest of the night. Nobody slept and we all called into work to try and figure something out. Now it's the next night and it's 11 at night. We are hearing scratching and growling through the house. We, we can't do this again. Please help. When I graduated from high school, I made an agreement with my parents that since I wasn't going to college, that I didn't want to spend all summer working full time. Instead, I opted to do DoorDash for some extra cash and to put money back for when I left, or just for my own smaller bills. On Friday, I decided to schedule myself to deliver, since my plans had fallen through earlier that day, and it beat just sitting in my bedroom. I scheduled my shift to start at 1 p.m., and set the location to be towards the downtown portion of my city. I figured things would be fine, considering it's well lit and it's always busy. I didn't take into consideration just how dangerous people could be, even in seemingly innocent places. The first half of my deliveries went smoothly enough. The tips were good and the customers were nice enough. Around 8 p.m., I felt myself getting sleepy and decided that after one more delivery, I would call it a night. I crossed my fingers and hoped for the best. It took a few minutes for my phone to ping with a notification and I saw that the guaranteed pay was $50. Of course, I did a double take and hesitated, waiting for the miles to load. I thought for sure that with a payout like that, I would end up driving several miles out of my radius, but it was a pleasant surprise to see that it was less than 18 miles, and it was headed back towards where I was staying, so it wouldn't put me too far out gas-wise. I clicked accept and went for it with nothing to lose. As I navigated my CRV through downtown, I ended up at a little hole-in-the-wall Mediterranean restaurant where I picked up a fair-sized order. It came in two plastic bags with one large drink. I made sure to handle everything carefully as I placed it in the passenger seat and set off once again. My GPS was taking me through the winding city streets. As I was driving, I examined the older styled houses. Soon enough, I turned my car into an older portion of the city. It wasn't the greatest crime-wise, and often on the weekends, it would get rowdy enough. There were two sides to this portion of the neighborhood. On one side, you had the large style historic Victorian houses, and on the other, ramshackle homes that looked like they could fall apart if the wind blew the right way. As I watched my GPS tick down the miles, it brought me to a home that I couldn't tell fell into which category. It seemed like a combination of both. It looked like a large home that had maybe been used as an apartment previously, with steps leading up the side to another door that was on the top floor. I parked my car and kept my headlights on, 
because even though the street lamps were there, it was still darker than I liked. Double checking the delivery address against what was on the home's gate, I saw it matched and went around to grab the food and made my way to the door. I got closer to the door and something just didn't feel right even as I walked up. As I went to knock, the door flew open and on the other side was a girl who couldn't have been much older than me. Unfortunately for me, I was involved in a new beta testing project that DoorDash was doing that made it to where I could accept cash and give change. I opted in just to see what it was about, but right then I was kicking myself, thinking how incredibly stupid the idea was. I tried not to let my poker face falter. Behind the girl, the house was dark. There wasn't a singular light on that I could see. There wasn't even a glow from the television in the living room. Besides that, the girl herself was strange. She seemed stiff. It was like she was a marionette puppet or something. She stood there for a few seconds, looking me over, and didn't say a word. I cleared my throat and announced her total, creeped out by the silent act. When I looked at her, I noticed a hint of something in her eyes. It looked a lot like fear. I reached out to hand her the food and take the money, but when I did, her hand shot out and grabbed at my wrist like it was her only lifeline. I was startled, but I didn't make any sudden movements, and instead trailed my eyes to her hands. I noticed that on her wrist she had bruises, and two of her nails were broken off. Now, when I say nails, I do not mean acrylics. I'm talking her original nails were gone, and in their place, a bloody pink spot where tender flesh was poking through. I looked up at her once again, and about that time the door opened all the way, revealing a man. Not just a man, a beast of a man. He was at least six foot five and was built like a quarterback. It was a giant contrast to the small woman who was in front of me. I stared blankly at them both, and he grinned, revealing yellow teeth. He made up some excuse about leaving the money inside, and invited me in to get it with them. Something in my gut told me to stay where I was, and I declined, opting to explain that I needed to stay outside, since it was against the rules to enter the home. I waited for them both to turn away, but it was just him. As he skulked away, the girl stared at me, and I heard her faintly start to mumble. I looked around behind her, and the other thing that stood out was that there was simply nothing inside the home. It was pitch black, and the only thing I could make out was what looked like a mattress on the floor. I had questioned where this man went to get the money, but the girl broke my train of thought. I could barely make out her whispers but I heard her clearly tell me to run. I paused, trying to take in what she said, and she stared me down with this cold look and snatched my hand from my side and placed something in my palm before closing my fist around it and dropping my hand. Around that time, he appeared. He started to make up an excuse that he couldn't find his wallet and for me to come in because he felt bad making me stand outside, and I caught a glimpse of the girl who briefly shook her head side to side. She was telling me not to. Quickly, I smiled and told him not to worry about it. I said to consider it a good deed, and I started to step backwards until I was a safe enough distance to get in my car and drive a short distance up the road. For good measure, I took a screenshot of the address. I pulled my car along the curb a few houses up, so I was out of sight, and it was only then that I uncurled my hand, and I nearly threw up. The two nails that were missing from her fingers were now in my hands, tinged with dried blood. I started to feel my breathing coming in gasps. I shook my hand out into the cup holder and picked up the phone. Frantically, I logged out of my delivery app and called the police. The officer was nice enough to meet me at the corner of the street where I parked, and even he was shocked when I showed him what the woman put in my hands. However, it wasn't until an elderly woman came out of her house beside us that we had more confirmation that something was wrong. When the officer asked about the house, she looked at us both confused and explained that the house had been abandoned for a while and nobody had lived there for years. Things started to register for the officer, who called for backup. The officer took my information down and told me that I was free to go and he would call if I was needed. The elderly woman, also with her interest piqued, watched as he got in his cruiser and headed to the home. When she saw me hesitating, she invited me inside for a bit to explain to her what happened. Honestly, I think she was just as nosy as I was, because by then, I was invested. I sat in her home for an hour, 
and all at once, sirens flew by her front window. At least five cars in a row followed by an ambulance. I finally left after that and headed home. I was curious what happened all that night, and the next day, the officer called me. He let me know that the home I went to wasn't meant to have someone living there. The two people there turned out to be a 20-year-old woman and her estranged husband. They had hit a rocky patch, and she was leaving him. He wound up taking her after he lured her to talk about the divorce. She'd been in that house for at least three days. The man got too paranoid to leave her alone in the house, but he got hungry. She convinced him to order delivery, and that was when I arrived. The last bit of information I received was that she told the detectives he never had any intention of paying me, and she knew that. She wouldn't let me come in, because if I did, she was afraid she'd never reach help. Okay, so this feels really weird to say, but a quick disclaimer, when this happened, I was sober not asleep and totally in my right mind. I was 18 at the time. It was late August, at around 11pm, but I live in Ireland, so it was still pretty much freezing outside. My parents had went to see my uncle over in Scotland, because he was sick, and my older sister was staying at a friend's, so I was alone. I wasn't scared though, because although I believed in ghosts, I never thought anything this creepy could happen to me. I had been watching Mean Girls with Lupin, my husky, sitting on my lap, and when the TV just turned off. No lights were on at the time, so I just thought it was the television being annoying. I wasn't scared, but then, Lupin started to freak out. He jumped up and started to bite and pull up my sleeve, trying to tug me out of the room. I tried to calm him down, but he wasn't having it, so I just went with it and he led me to the kitchen at the back of the house. That was when there was a knock on the door. This was really weird. I live in the countryside, and my closest neighbors are about a half a mile down the road, but I guess I wasn't really thinking. I went to leave the kitchen, and Lupin jumped in front of me and started to growl. This was scary. Lupin is the chillest dog ever. He barely even barks, let alone growls, and never at me. I tried speaking loudly to him and pushed by him, but he just started pulling on my sleeve, trying to pull me back into the kitchen. I pushed on, thinking he was just freaked out by the television going out. When I got to the door, I could hear him start whimpering, and as I turned to look at him, I heard a voice coming from outside the door. Please, miss, we need your help. I really didn't think about it at the time. I just heard a kid's voice and I felt that I had to help. But my door was solid wood. They wouldn't have known I was a girl. I opened the door, and there were two kids that I didn't know, standing shoulder to shoulder. Both were girls, one about 14 or 15, and the other was a lot younger, maybe 7 or 8. But I couldn't see very well because it was dark, and I didn't have the lights on. From what I could see, they were wearing normal clothes, but as I looked down, I saw that they didn't have any shoes on, and it was freezing. I was about to tell them to come in, but then Lupin jumped past me and started growling and barking. He looked possessed, and I was really freaked out. I started to pull him back by the collar and put him in the living room, locking the door behind me. I apologized, but then I stopped. The girls didn't look startled at all. They just stood there not moving. The older of the two said, Please, let us in, miss. We need to call her mother. This was weird, because I couldn't tell where she was from. She didn't have my accent, but it was kind of neutral, and no one I know calls their mom mother. It just seemed odd. I asked her why they didn't have shoes on, and they both just looked at each other and said, Please, let us in. We need to call her mother. I felt so uneasy. My chest was tight and I was almost shaking with fear and I didn't know why. It was then that I finally did something smart. And there was a light switch near the door. I hit it and the light behind me came on and the world seemed to stop. 
They had no whites to their eyes and no iris. Their eyes were just black. I couldn't move. Then the younger one said, Let us in, miss. I just slammed the door and locked it, hyperventilating. Lupin was banging against the living room door, trying to be let out. So I ran to it and opened it, and he just threw himself on me, whimpering. The kids were still at the door. The younger one was shouting, Let us in. We need you to let us in. I screamed and told them to leave, and they just kept banging. I ran upstairs. I looked out the top window, and the kids had moved to the bottom of the driveway, and were looking right at me. I tried to scream, but no noise came out. I ducked down and looked up, maybe 10 seconds later, but they were gone. This scared me even more, not knowing where they were. I called my sister and made her come home. I never saw them again, and haven't slept properly since. It's been two years. I only found out recently that black-eyed kids are a thing, and I'm not sure if it gives me closure or makes it even more terrifying.